Hello, beer enthusiasts, brewers, and hopheads. This is Doug Piper, and today you're in for a real treat because we're about to tap into a conversation with none other than Vinny Serluzzo. He's the founder and creator of the renowned Pliny the Elder IPA. He's also founder and brewmaster of the famed Russian River Brewing Company. Vinny unravels the secrets of brewing IPAs that he's accumulated over the decades. From the intricate art of dry hopping to the surprising effects of hop creep and to the pivotal role of yeast health. There's plenty brewing in this conversation. And you know what they say about saving the best for last? We've got Vinny spilling his secrets on why a particular malt could be an unexpected culprit in compromising your IPAs. Intrigued? You should be. So grab your preferred pint. And let's dive into this conversation with Vinny. Cheers. Vinny, before we do a kickoff question, I have all these beautiful beers in front of me. I want everybody to see what 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 envious refrigerator I have right now. Uh, I want to open one of these guys. Which one do you think would be the most appropriate? For us I, I think open. I think for your opening beer uh, from ours, because I know we're going to taste the goose in a little bit, I'd, I'd go with the Blind Pig. It's the mildest of the hops of those uh, beers from Russian River. Go with Blind Pig. I was just going to say the Happy Hops is a little more over the top. So I, I would go with the Blind Pig IPA. It's kind of our classic, you know, classic West Coast IPA. It's often uh, our, you know, employees co-workers favorite beers here at the brewery so I, I definitely go with blind pig well and i have to admit in a recent tasting of steve mornigan and whip they're there in the audience uh we all decided we'd like the blind pig the best too <laughs> you know we hear that a lot but somehow <laughs> pliny uh outsells it by a lot so well, yeah we here here at the production brewery uh several of the uh you know we have 12 CCT closed top fermenters and, you know, like 40 or 50% of them or more are always just filled with, with, with Pliny. I think it's, I think Pliny's 65, 70% of our production. It's a pretty big, big load of our production, but blind, blind yeah. pig is, is a favorite too. All right. Well, we're going, we're going to start with that guy. Uh, if you don't mind, if you don't mind describing that, Ter Terrence says blind pig is the goat. <laughs> Joshua says he agrees, and Steve Morgan says yes, blind pig. So uh, in our audience here, it's certainly getting some high marks. Yeah, yeah. So the blind pig um, compared to Pliny is is a much lighter uh, hop load. Um, it also focuses on some old school hop varieties, although it has Amarillo in it. It has a little bit of Simcoe and a little bit of Citra. Um, it's still a good portion, Cascade, Centennial, uh, and Chinook. And, and it really does kind of harken back to the old days. But as we'll get into in a little bit, you know, later on in, um, in the video cast here, you know, that recipe has changed over time and um, just as Pl Pliny has as, as well. Um, you know, we've, when we're going to talk about crystal malt and specifically how it relates to IPA, um, and so same thing here, we've, we've reduced it out, removed it, reduced it, and then removed it um, to really uh, showcase the hops more. And so you're still going to get a nice um, malt backbone to this beer, to Blind Pig. Um, and the hops themselves are definitely present, uh, but at just six and a quarter percent alcohol, it's definitely lighter on the hops and the mouthfeel compared to, to Pliny. And um you know, it's it's just over one pound per barrel dry hop. So, you know, and I know in some breweries, that's just like downright pedestrian. Um, and and I can say that jokingly um, that, you know, whatever it's at, 1.1, 1.2 pound per barrel. Um, I mean, we have pale ales that are dry hopped at that level now, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, there's a time and place for a lighter alcohol, a uh, little more easy drinking. Everything doesn't have to be just about more hops, more hops, more hops in an IPA. There really, um, there really can be a place to have a nice firm malt foundation. And there's definitely more malt showing in Blind Pig than there does 
uh, in Pliny the Elder. That's that's for sure. Look at the head on that guy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That uh, is beautiful. Yeah. And it's and it's rocky. Yeah, and it's, it's like a, a floated dime on it. Firm. That's that. That's that old trick from the Germans. I think it. I think it was. Well, I, I know I was uh, talking to uh, Scott Jennings, and he was talking about his celebration ale, and he said he's trying to get it up to a quarter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and then, also a little bit of bottle conditioning will help there too, give you a little better foam. This is not bottle conditioned. It's I, I never advocate to bottle condition IPAs because the yeast in the bottle condition process will actually take up some of the hop aroma and, and flavor. So it's not something that we advocate for. Um, definitely in Belgian beers, not in IPAs. So, and, you know, the, there's an interesting uh, addition to that recipe recently was we were, you know, even though I talk about that beer being a little bit on, you know, the softer side compared to Pliny, it's lower in alcohol, we were still we were looking for a way recently to still lift the citrus notes out of the centennial and the cascade and and the other qualities of some of the hops and in the pilot brewery here it's a little five barrel pilot brewery that i run i started messing around with this kind of newer hop called talus and talus has this beautiful pink grapefruit note if you use it in the right amount and um so we i messed around with adding a little bit to a blind pig or, recipe or version of it. And I really liked what we saw. So we've actually recently, uh, maybe a couple of years ago now, a year ago, added just a tiny, tiny bit of talus to the dry hop. And it just has a way of lifting all the other hops in there. If you, if you add too much talus, it ends up having uh, this very almost coconut quality because it's, it's, uh, it's the daughter to Sabro. Sabro is a newer hop variety that's very, very coconut and tropical in that sense. And it can be a little off-putting, as, as can Talus to a lot of people. But Talus has this beautiful pink grapefruit. We were trying to get more citrus, so we've, we've incorporated just a sliver of it into the hop bill, dry hop bill. So this, that brings me to my question. So what are some of the challenges and breakthroughs you experienced while creating the now iconic Pliny the Elder, but you also created Blind Pig too, I do believe, <laughs> a yeah. beer that has greatly influenced the craft beer world scene, not only in California, but around the world. I think you get people from all over the world when Pliny's ready yeah. to be shipped. So yeah. tell us about that. What were some of the challenges and breakthroughs? You, you know, Pliny the Elder was a bit of a slow burn, if you will. Um, you know, we started making it initially in uh, 2000 was uh, was the first time we, we made it. And um, before that, I was experimenting with a, a experimental hop called YCR014, which ended up becoming Simcoe. And that became the cornerstone to the Pliny uh Plenty of the Elder recipe, Plenty of the Younger didn't come along until 2005. And, and so, you know, it was just a constant change over time. But I think what I'm most proud of is that, you know, Simcoe was really the first of the new private, you know, what I jokingly call designer hop varieties. And it, 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 it was a struggle for Yakima Chief to sell it initially and the three families that that own uh, the three family farms that own Simcoe, Peralt, uh, Loftus, which is the Smith family, and then the Carpenters, yeah, they they a couple of those farms came pretty close to going out of business, um, and Simcoe kind of saved them. But you know, Simcoe was first harvested uh, in 2000, and there was just nine acres of it. And again, previously it was under the experimental name YCR014, and 2000 happens to be when we first brewed Pliny. Um, and by 2002, there was zero pounds of it harvested. And it, it was, it was, it was just, it, it just didn't take. At some point in there, I remember them telling me that they had to throw out 50,000 pounds. Um, but as it grew and by like 2012, it, I think it was like one and a half million pounds that they had um, produced. And the, the three families will talk about a parallel of basically the growth of Simcoe 
can parallel and can trace can be traced to Pliny because we were using it and we were talking about it and other brewers were following us using it. And and it's something that Natalie and I are really proud of because, you know, we we were able to help some family farms that at the time were really struggling. The hop industry is a lot stronger now, but uh, it wasn't back then. And, you know, to hear Mike Smith tell the story or Steve Peralt or Brad Carpenter tell, tell us, you know, how important Pliny was to their success of their farm in a really tough time um, is, is pretty humbling. Wow. I had no idea. <laughs> well, I, I think that's clearly one of the things you were getting. That is a unique story. I have, I yeah. have not heard that. That sounds like one that needs to be captured. <laughs> <laughs> it's been, it's been talked about, but it's not something that, you know, I don't know that's ever been written or wherever, whatever, but it it is something that we are very proud of. And, and it's, like I said, it's just a very humbling uh, thing to know that, you know, you've helped some family farms, which, you know, as we all know, they're kind of the cornerstone of the U S agriculture and, um, and it's tough. Farming's tough, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, hops or anything else. Well, Vinny, I promised everybody we would talk about dry hopping. And I've got a question for you. Cause I mean, it, it, it seems like you can't put enough hops. Now you may not be able to afford to put all the hops <laughs> in a beer that you want, but it seems like we're, you know, in a hop race and, but there's some weird things that seem to be going on that if you keep increasing dry hops, there seems to be a change in the bitterness that, that I don't understand. And I'll bet you do. Can you enlighten us on that? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty um, counterintuitive, but, um, and I, I can't remember who did the initial work on this, if it was one of the hop purveyors or if it was um, Tom Shellhammer up at Oregon state, but basically the more you dry hop, the uh, less bitter it becomes via isomerized alpha acids. So the alpha acids or the bitterness that's contributed through the hops you add in the kettle on the hot side, those will actually reduce over uh, an, in, in a an heavily dry hopped beer because essentially you have those isomerized alpha acids in the beer in your tank and they're, for lack of better words, being reabsorbed into the green matter of the dry hops and then those dry hops fall to the bottom of the tank, you dump the cone, and basically you've you've discharged um, that. And and I don't know where the exact point is, um, you know, specifically because it's another part that needs to be brought up here is just how um, insignificant the IBU rating is now, uh, you know, this day and age with uh with ipas and that that really leans into um this compound called a humulinone and humulinones are um for like most basic simple way to describe them is they're oxidized alpha acids and but but one unit of humulinone isn't the same as one bu of um isomerized alpha acid a, a humulinone is only 0.66 as bitter. So basically 0.66 BU value of humulinone is one BU of isomerized alpha acid. And so when you run the traditional IBU measurement on the spectrophotometer, which is what, if, if a brewery has a lab and they are measuring BUs, they're most likely doing it on a spectrophotometer. There is this thing uh, called an HPLC that, you know, a, a larger um, quality focus brewery would have that, such as like Sierra Nevada, I'm sure, has an HPLC and, and others at their size or bigger. Um, and certainly, you know, hop purveyors would. Um, and there you can measure BUs and break everything apart. You can break out what uh, bitterness was contributed from isomerized alpha acids from just the few regular alpha acids that do actually make it into the final beer, the humulinones and those. And so you can take a measurement and get a, a feeling for really where you're at. But when you run a BU test, an international bittering unit test on a spectrophotometer, 
uh, like I said, that's what most small breweries have. It doesn't know the difference between a humulinone and an isomerized alpha acid. So it's just taken a total measurement and it gets a little bit mixed up. And so, so the, the IBU measurement is a little obsolete in finished beer. It's not, it's not a bad thing to, um, to use if you're just trying to track, say, your bitterness on the hot side with your wort. And we'll, we'll still do those tests on occasion just to make sure that our wort BU is tracking somewhere in the right neighborhood. Um, so for Pliny, I think we're at like 110 to 120, and you lose a lot in fermentation by yeast, by way of yeast or, or what have you. And, and so now you've got this beer that is lost some bitterness from the, you know, let's say a heavily hot beer like Pliny that's lost some beer uh, from the uh, hot side that are isomerized alpha acids. But when you dry hop with a big load, those dry hops are contributing these humulinones so you're gaining uh, bitterness back, but it's at a 0.66 uh, percentage compared to one isomerized alpha, abuse of isomerized alpha acid. So hopefully that makes sense, but it, in short, it just kind of mixes things up, makes it a big, you know, mixed bowl of fruit, and it's tough to really find the true exact number. And so that's why a lot of small breweries don't even measure IBUs anymore in their finished beer. And we don't. We, we, we might do it on occasion just for fun, but because um, it's just not accurate. And, and, and for us, it's a great comparison to... Uh, we have our regular Pliny the Elder, and then we make a special one-off version that we can three, four times a year called DDH, so double dry hop Pliny the Elder. And there, we've instead of using the two pound per barrel in regular Pliny in the DDH that you just held up, that's four pound per barrel. And it's a great comparison because when you taste them side by side, the DDH is actually less bitter. Well, speaking of that, that's next, right? That is, whenever you're ready. <laughs> well, the other thing is, I promised to uh, show that video before we leave or right before we get into Pliny uh, of uh, your open top fermenter. Is this a yeah. good time to do yeah. that? Yeah, why, why don't you do that? I can talk you through it, and then uh, we can get into the beers. Hi, right, here we are in our OTF room. This is the first two batches of Pliny the Younger for 2023 our wholesale distribution. Uh, we love making this beer in our open top fermenters. We feel that it really adds the complexity and the softness to the beer. The recipe for planting the younger this year is pretty much the same as last, with the addition of a new hop called Nectaron, which is a beautiful New Zealand hop that we used earlier in the year on the R&D brew. Can't wait to have a younger with all of you. Cheers. Yeah, so that was, that was there in our OTF room, and that was the first run of Pliny the Younger in 2023. That was for the wholesale distribution. Then we brew it again for our in-person release here. And um, yeah, open top fermentation is often thought of as a, you know, German Weizen wheat beer uh, tank. Um, there are lots of breweries in Germany using it for Helles and Pilsner. My favorite is, is Schoen Rahm, uh, our friend Eric Toft, American who brews there. Um, absolutely stunning, beautiful beers. Um, and, and you see, you know, old school British and Belgian, and of course you have cool ships, but that's a little bit different. Um, and, and so we use open tops for all of our lagers, for a lot of our Belgian uh, inspired beers, but we use it as much as we can for our hoppy beers. And in that case, plenty of the younger, we find that the one-to-one -one ratio, it's as wide as it is tall. And we can blow off a lot of those fusel alcohols and get a much cleaner uh, beer. And we end up with a, uh, a beer that on the back end is 10 and a quarter percent alcohol has almost no alcohol uh, flavor to it. And we really think the open tops have a lot to do with that. So we're, we're super excited to be able to offer that and to show people what open tops are like. And we're not the only brewery in America with them. Um, that type that we had in that video, that's uh, Sierra Nevada and Mills River have those identical tanks. And New Glarus has similar open tops in at their brewery as well. Well, I'm ready to give this plane a pour. Would you... Uh... Do me a favor and describe what uh, we, we're enjoying here for everybody else. Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
you know, we, it is limited distribution. We sell 80% of our beer here in California. Um, I, I saw Drew on the, the chat there on the side. I know he can get it and uh, probably has some, so hopefully. But yeah, Pliny is definitely a, uh, it's a hop forward beer. I talked about it being two pounds, a little over two pound per barrel dry hop. Uh, it's, it's definitely got a light yellow uh, copper uh, color. Um, the aroma is going to be pine, citrus type, and citrus when I'm, I'm thinking grapefruit specifically. Uh, there might be some lychee uh, fruit in there a little bit. Um, there might be just a small amount of onion garlic, uh, a little bit of dankness, but, but only a, a, a small amount. If there's a lot, then we haven't done our job right, but that's a hard thing to control when you're dry hopping it over two pounds per barrel. Um, flavor is going to be very similar. Uh, and it has a striking bitterness to it. I've always loved bitterness. And for several years now, and, and a lot through a lot of the you know, growth of hazy IPA, there's been a bit of an assault on bitterness in the beer industry. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm fine with someone not you know, making a beer that's bitter. That's you know, like an IPA. But for me personally, I think it's the bitterness is what draws you back and wants you to keep uh, you know, drinking more, it's that thirst quenching component of an IPA or a Pilsner for that matter. Like, you know, to me, a well-made, a well-made Pilsner is going to have a really clean, crisp, dry, bitter finish. And that just want, brings you back to, to drink more. And so for, for, for Pliny being a double IPA, um, that bitterness is an important component and it's something that we've never shied away from. We use a bittering hop called Warrior that's a uh, really clean bitterness and it's something that I've always uh, liked since the day it came out and um, and something we still use to this day. Well, you know, I'm impressed with how bright it is. I'll be honest, that was unexpected. And there's there's also a stone fruit component that comes from Amarillo. Amarillo is the kind of second hop. If I had to go down the hop bill and say, okay, there's Simcoe's the number one used hop and then uh, Amarillo would be number two. We're looking for a very specific Simcoe variety or a Simcoe uh, flavor and aroma as well as Amarillo. For Simcoe, let's just call the picking window 10 days. Uh, we want to be typically between four and five days. And Simcoe was the first hot variety for me that taught me that picking window matters. So in that 10 day picking window, and it might be a little bit longer now, but let's just call it 10 days because what it should be. Early Simcoe will give you uh, a lot of grapefruit, really light, crisp grapefruit, middle harvest window pin Simcoe. So early harvest window is uh, the grapefruit, middle harvest window is uh, pine, and then late harvest window is gonna be more like dank and cannabis and more onion garlic. And then if you go like early middle, it's gonna have some grapefruit and some pine, and that's that's right where Natalie and I want to be with the um, the Simcoe that we pick. With Amarillo, we want lots of stone fruit, peach, apricot, um, and Amarillo is grown in so many places that the picking window is, is just massive. It's you know, at one point it was like a thirty day picking window, and that's really hard to control. So we we go with some very specific farms for our Amarillo to ensure that we can have a tighter picking window to pick from. And then we can get that old school Amarillo that I remember using in the early 2000s that has big peach apricot stone fruit notes. And I can't stand it any longer. <laughs> mm. And the, I have the same bottling that you have, mm. which was um, wow. just th three days ago. So I, I, Shipped you that on Monday. I think you got it Tuesday or Wednesday. We pulled it, literally pulled it right off the, the bottling line when, uh, when, when we shipped it to you. So, but freshness matters. That's, you yeah. know, nobody, no, nobody should buy an IPA off the shelf. And I don't care whose it is, if it's a mega brewery or a tiny, small brewery, no one should buy an IPA off the shelf if it's not kept cold. And um, that's, I know that doesn't work with mainstream distribution in a lot of places, but um, you know, check the check the bottling or canning date, um, and and if there isn't one, I wouldn't buy it either. We have Natalie and I have very strict rules about that too. Yeah, I thought looks like that head's holding up nicely, and 
I think there's a little something going on in the bottom of that glass. Yep, there is some nucleation as well on the bottom. So it's a little little trick uh, that uh, that we do with our with, with some of our glassware, and uh, we love to have that etch down there, and it just helps keep the foam. But um, you know, our, our brewing team works really hard though, because you know you drink with your nose and you drink with your eyes as well, and um, you know, hazy IPA turned that on its head. Uh, which is great because Hazy IPA brought a ton of new, fresh ideas to really make your beers even more hoppy and like umptuous hoppy, if you will. Um, I, I kind of feel like that's how we've always made Pliny. We've always had like big, big Whirlpool editions. And although, you know, we have done hop editions throughout the, um, the, the brewing kettle hot side, you know, we've and we've adjusted those as well we've always made really big um you know whirlpool additions to get not only a big hop aroma from dry hop but the flavor as well well what i was doing here and i thought you might be able to explain it a little bit so it's not that blind pigs that much better uh but they're you know the differences between them can you can you share that i thought pliny was brighter than the blind pig but i'm not sure it is now looking at them and the color is almost yeah. identical yeah they're both they're both run through a centrifuge only um and so there's no filter after the centrifuge um and and we're then we're capturing some CO2 in the fermenter, but we're giving it the rest of its carbonation coming out of the centrifuge in line. And the both recipes now are for Blind Pig and Pliny the Elder, and for that matter, the DDH, it's just silo malt, our two row uh, that we get from RAR uh, malting. And then uh, Pliny gets a little bit of sugar to give it just some really simple sugars for fermentables. And then um, and, and that's that's really it. And there's also a little bit of best pale in the uh, blind pig, which is an English uh, malt from Simpson malt. And that's just to add a little bit of body and mouthfeel to it because it is lower in alcohol. Uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of times when you think of like the big, the full flavored English malt, you're going to think of like Maris Otter or um, uh, like Golden Promise. And there you're getting these big nutty notes and when i discovered best pale gosh well over a decade ago it was all that fullness from that you get from say like maris otter but it didn't have all the the rich nutty malty notes and, and nothing against those they're great english beers but when using them in an american ipa like blind pig i was just looking for something to lift the body and i and we were looking for ways to not use like carapils or use more carapils because it's something that we used to use in that recipe, which is a dextrin unfermentable malt. And, um, and so that's going to contribute a tiny bit of color to the more color to the blind pig than the Pliny, but the flip side, the Pliny is a higher alcohol beer. So it's getting more base malt, more silo malt. And so it's gaining more color there also. So they probably kind of balance out in the middle. Uh, and what I thought I would do is pour the uh, double dry hop. Yeah, go for it. And I can talk about that if you want. And I'll yes. give it a give it a taste here. A little, little story about DDH Pliny. Um, that actually started out, and any, anyone that's on the uh, video cast today that maybe bought uh, our beer during the pandemic, they remember, and they, they probably know the story. Um, we They maybe bought the beer that we had called Pliny for President. And so we, for years, have had this fun little exercise every four years that we made t-shirts and hats or whatever that Pliny was running for president. And of course his running mate was blind pig. Um, and so in 2020, which was the middle of the pandemic, Natalie says to me, you know, we should, we should like bottle some Pliny under the Pliny for president, um, you know, moniker and create a label. And I said, well, we're going to do that. Let's uh, create a whole new recipe. So it wasn't that far off from regular Pliny, but in short, it was double dry hopped. And after uh, it, was a pretty smashing success and after the uh election was over um you know we said oh okay we're not going to make it for four years until 24 well we got so much pushback from our customers that we rebranded it 
DDH, double dry hop, Pliny the Elder, or specifically, as it says, two-stage double dry hop, Pliny the Elder. And uh, so for 2024, we will create a new Pliny for President recipe. It won't just be this one rehashed. I've, I'm starting to work on some stuff in the pilot brewery that I already have already. Um, and why specifically I said two-stage double dry hop is that double dry hop is, if, in a, in, to some degree, it's a marketing term and it does help sell beer. But I really wanted to, to let our customers know that not only did we double the amount of dry hops, but we added it over two stages. And we've monkeyed around with doing regular Pliny dry hops, one stage, two stage. Right now, we're, at, we're, we're doing it at one stage. Um, and so we truly make it, we make a two pound per barrel dry hop edition. And then a few days later, we make a second two pound per barrel dry hop edition. And thus the, the double, the two stage double dry hop. But when you, it's going to have a little bit more of a, uh, of a, the, peach apricot stone fruit aroma, at least that's what I get. Um, it's also, to me, tastes less bitter. Um, it's not remarkably less bitter. It's not a huge amount, but it's it's definitely there. And uh, and to me, again, it all goes back to that conversation that you're losing a little bit of BUs when you're, um, when you're doing uh, a heavy dry hop due to the dry hops absorbing some of the isomerized alpha acids. And it should also be noted that even though we're gaining some uh, bitterness from the humulinones, the oxidized alpha acids, that's a softer bitterness. And, and so it tends to not be as hard on the palate. So to me, it, I used to call it perceived bitterness. This is like 25 years ago. I had no idea what, what was going on. Um, now I understand through academia what humulinones are and how they work and what they contribute. And so there's this, there's this index of your hops called HSI, the hop storage index that the hop industry came up with decades ago. So in short, the higher the HSI, basically the poorer your hops are being stored or potential of being stored, um, the more oxidation you're having in your hops. And because humulinones are oxidized alpha acids, a higher HSI is going to mean that you're going to potentially have more humulinones and, and they're hard to control. So it really drives the point that hop storage at a brewery uh, or hop purveyor is really important and that the colder you store them, the more consistently you can keep uh, everything in the hops being fresh, but it's in the back end, you're going to end up with um, probably less inconsistency from the humulinone standpoint in an IPA. So as we compare these, uh, I'll bring it up full screen. You want to kind of contrast the two? Now we've lost the head yeah. pretty quick in the yeah. double different dry glass hop. too. Yep, and yeah. um, and the the um, the color should be almost the same. And it's you know those are different glasses, so hard to say exactly. But it it is the same uh, base malt bill. Now when we come back with our uh, twenty. 24 planning for president, that's going to end up being a, a different alcohol beer. I'm going to do something a little bit different, change it up the hot bill. It'll still have a through line of, of, of a Simcoe through it. That's for sure. Um, but, um, but from a flavor standpoint, like I said, the, uh, the regular plane is actually just a little bit more bitter. And, and we, we see these emails from customers all the time because, you know, they, they love to do the Pepsi challenge of regular Pliny and DDH Pliny and, do that side by side comparison, especially if you can get, you know, cans and bottles that are within a couple of weeks of each other. You can really tell uh, uh, and, and see the difference there. And and I just I just think it's the coolest thing that adding more ends up almost giving you a little bit less, even though you're adding these humulones back, which are in fact bitter, but they're a little cleaner bitterness. Well, I am ready to do this Pepsi challenge. Yeah, and and something I'll I'll mention when you're tasting, maybe do your initial taste, is that they are pretty light, and there there's there's definitely not a lot of color to them. As I mentioned, we're now just using our base two row silo malt that we get from our malting, and then Pliny gets a little sugar, and um, they, well, they both get a little sugar. It's the same malt bill for the beer because they're both 8% alcohol too. But I'm curious of your thoughts. 
What what is the ABV? What do you think it is? <laughs> I don't know, but that double dry hop that could sneak up on you. <laughs> they're both they're both eight percent alcohol, and uh, I remember I remember one year for Pliny the Younger, our good friend John Mallet, who uh, used to run Bells, is now uh, retired from Bells, uh, happened to be in the area for Pliny the Younger, and we were sitting at the pub drinking some Youngers, and he looked at me and goes, "What's what's the, we always did a trade of." hop slam for younger because they always came out about the same time of year so it was always really fun and he's like what's the alcohol i got 10 and a quarter he's like yep you win the award for hide the alcohol so (laughs) i i I wear that with a badge of honor that yeah and and with regular elder too and that has a lot to do with how we mash the grains the use of sugar to make it dry very drinkable almost take a pilsner approach to it in dryness Mm -hmm. um now, granted, there's a lot of breweries that make much drier beer now. We, for for those are that are are listening or watching that are you know brewers, we're finishing at about two and a half Play-Doh, and that to me is a sweet spot. If it's any drier than that, if we get closer to two Play-Doh, then the beer becomes just a little too thin, and also it shows the bitterness a little too much. But more importantly, it shows the alcohol more typically. Um, if it's any higher than two and a half Play-Doh, 2.6 is 2.5 to 2.6 Play-Doh is like my range. If it's any higher than say 2.6, then we're getting a little bit too sweet and cloying. And it it blows me away to hear some hazy IPA brewers talk about their beers finishing at like four Play-Doh, four and a half Play-Doh. Um, it's no knock against them that, you know, it just... It's not something that I could do, even with our hazy IPA that we make on occasion. But um, but I but I love the aroma of DDH. I mean, regular Pliny's great, but DDH just takes it over the top. The one in the center is Blind Pig. This yeah. one, that's probably not working too well there. Let me. Yeah, that looks good. Re- rearrange these a little bit. Yeah. Um. Maybe we'll do this. Probably not the best order. But but you can see the color. They're all the same. Imagine imagine being a bartender or, or particularly a server. So the bartender takes or a server takes an order from a, a table and you know, let's just say it's a blind pig, a regular Pliny, and a DDH, because we actually have all three of those on right now. And if you were to pour happy hops, that other bottle I sent you, it's the same color. Um, and then the server comes to the server station and has to figure out which one is what. So we have a a specific protocol on how you do these things and, you know, being in alphabetical order, basically, because everything looks the same. And that's, you know, the, for small breweries and and we're 40,000 barrels, we're not a small brewery anymore, but we, Natalie and I still think that way. And we still run our brewery as a small brewery. And that's why we have a little five barrel pilot brewery to be innovative and create new brands and come up with new processes. And maybe we learn from some of the young bucks and the kids in the industry these days, as we jokingly say, but like, you know, that's something where we've, we've continued to move and, you know, in the direction of making our hoppy beers lighter and lighter to make the malt bill lighter, to let the hops come through and kind of blast through more. And that was a lot to do with removing crystal malt from the recipes seems like there's a little more body in Pliny. yeah but I'm, i may have to take back my blind pig being my favorite that double <laughs> is pretty awesome <laughs> and and i'll and i'll add that i did take the time to look at the uh finishing uh numbers on both the ddh and the uh the regular Pliny, and they were within like a tenth of a Play-Doh, which is pretty tough to taste in a beer that this is that that is this hoppy. So you're you're pretty much right at eight percent alcohol on both of those, and and also you know so one thing with the TTB, you have a 0.3 percent window of alcohol, so the Pliny could technically be as low as 7.7 and as high as 8.3. Um, if if in a in a perfect world we will always be at eight. 
But if it's going to shift one way or the other, I'd rather it be lower than higher because when it gets up to like 8.2, and we've had times where it was 8.2, 8.3, the alcohol just shows through. It's too hot. There's too much heat. And you do start tasting that heat more uh, in, in Pliny. And so it's really important to nail the 8%, not just from the legal standpoint, but also like that's what the consumer is expecting. And it's what we expect of ourselves for consistency. Crystal malt came up, Benny, and you've mentioned it in the discussion. Uh, we've talked about it a little bit. Uh, yeah. I was... You challenged me to go find a widely distributed IPA without any crystal malt. Uh, I actually contacted Mr. Mallet and I contacted Charlie Bamsforth. And I went down a long list of them. Yeah. And Mitch Steele was the one who came through and he said, Doc, go get a Goose Island IPA. It does not have any. It's widely distributed. Well, darn it. I looked on their website. And they, the website said C60, but I talked to the brewer, Daryl, just an hour or two ago. He said it's actually C60 and not C20. Yeah. Um, so what, what is it about crystal malt? You avoid it, it sounds like, at all costs, although you used to use it. I thought I heard earlier. But why do you believe that crystal hurts the drinking pleasure or the drinking experience? Um, how, how did you make this decision and how does it impact the final beer? Yeah. So, uh, first off I'll say, yeah, we definitely did once use crystal malt in, um, Pliny. Let's just use Pliny for example, cause we make so much of it, but I took the time earlier and I have this binder that has some old brew logs in it. And I found the very first Pliny brew log. And so I'm just looking at my notes here and that was in, uh, uh, 2000 was the first time we made Pliny and it had 3.85% crystal malt in it. And um, that was a mix of crystal 40 and 15. Um, so not a huge amount still. And that was always the cornerstone of West Coast IPA is that it was, you know, had a little bit of crystal malt, but it wasn't like an English IPA that had a much larger amount that had a much deeper color. Um, and then I scrolled through some old brew logs. In 2015, we were down to 1.3%, and that was crystal uh, 40. And um, in 2018, we're at, and that's about when we opened our Windsor, California production brewery, we were at 0.6%. So you can see that we were whittling it down. And then a couple years ago, um, we started removing it completely. And for that transition, we went with Munich 30 and some Crystal 40 and then slowly transitioned to all Munich 30 and then eventually transitioned out of that. Um, because honestly, at that point, we didn't see a difference. The Munich wasn't contributing that much more malt fullness. And we could gain that back from a higher mash temperature, trying to hit two and a half Play-Doh. And granted, through all this, we were dialing in our German brew house, which takes a while. So anyway, so we are now, so you can just kind of see the, the, the path that we took. And when you make uh, crystal malts, um, you know, there's a roasting process. And yes, some uh, caramel malts is always a di distinction that I will say are kiln, but crystal malts are roasted. You've got the melanoidin um, process happening, where ba which is basically like, it's browning of um, of the grain. That's like some polymers are formed, and in the in the mallard reaction, you've got the color formation, aroma, flavor, and this happens with coffee, chocolate. It's it's all over the food industry, um, and and there's an it's it's a little there's no hard science on this topic per se. I was I was actually looking for some papers on it um, before uh, the the video cast here the other day. And, um, but you see more like anecdotal information that crystal caramel malts will cause oxidation. Um, and, and it's, 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 it's really just an accelerated oxidative process that it's probably more than anything. It's just chipping away at the hop character and that really fresh crispness of, of a, of an IPA. And, and it might just be that, it's the 
the actual like there's something else oxidizing that's causing that i you know it's it's a little bit beyond my uh my pay grade but those those caramel and toffee flavors of those kind of mid-range crystal malts you know that they're oxidizing themselves and then they just take on a fuller more deep fruit i don't know maybe i don't know raisin I, i'm not sure what what else to say or current or something like that um but it it at the end of the day you're still seeing lots of larger craft breweries adding crystal malt to their ipa um but you're there's not a lot of smaller breweries a lot of small unless they're like classically making a an old school west coast ipa um they're, they've really pulled back. All of my brewer friends, at least here on the West Coast, have have pulled back from crystal malts on their uber hoppy beers. Um, and and it's and it could just be that like in, in doing some of this research to really drill down into it to try to find some actual written um, you know text on this is just could be like those melanoidins themselves are what are oxidizing. And and then through fermentation or there was some stuff that talked about, you know, like before fermentation that there's some oxidation going on and then through you know, fermentation and it can get really deep and scientific that, you know, you've got this issue and then somehow you're, you're creating aldehydes. And if you research aldehydes and, and um, oxidation, you've got you know, if, 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 you, if you're going to be forming some aldehydes during the malting process or the roasting process, then potentially those are compounds that are um, oxidized and, and aldehydes are an oxidative compound, um, or at least they're partly an oxidative compound in beer. So it's, it's a little scientific and, and very wonky, um, but at the same time, like there's so much there's so many small breweries that just have gone away from crystal malt and, and you and I were talking about it before when we were, you know, just making sure our connection was right, was that the big, bigger breweries, whether they're big craft breweries or industrial breweries, they're not the first ones to, to make a change. You know, think of hazy IPA is a perfect example. You know, the big craft breweries didn't jump on Sierra Nevada, New Belgium, didn't jump on and make a hazy beer right away. They waited, watched the trends, and and they eventually came on and and both make really great hazy IPAs. Um, and and so I think this is maybe one of those cases too, where you've got small breweries leading the way, just like home brewers lead the way to come up with creative and innovative recipes and techniques and whatnot. And and maybe that's the same thing here, um, but. You know, even at 40,000 barrels, as I said earlier, we kind of think of ourselves as a small brewery. And, and maybe it's also what's kept Pliny relevant is that we've always changed. We've continued to tweak the recipe. And, and so it's something that we followed the science and, and we followed what our polio factor, our sensory, you know, we, were, we just did sensory training earlier with our, with our team. And, and for that, we were doing off flavor and oxidation is is one of those those flavors and uh and that's something you get when you have an ipa that is got crystal malt and it might not be the crystal malt either that's maybe triggering the oxidation or all the oxidation there's there could i mean i've speculated that the heavy uh hop load that we add that maybe the hops because of like fertilizers they have a little more heavy metals we're adding more uh hops to our beers and maybe that's triggering oxidation but what we know for sure is from your malt you have what's called fan free amino nitrogen and fan has one use and one use only and that's as a um, yeast nutrient and so any excess fan in your beer ends up in time um, becoming an oxidative property strucker degradation and and if you're have all this excess fan in your beer, you're going to end up with a beer that oxidizes faster. Well, if you're making a big IPA, you're going to add more malt, and that means that you're adding more fan. Your yeast is only going to use so much, and then you're going to have more fan than, say, a light golden ale or a you know light lager or something. Those big breweries are adding 30, 40 percent um, 
adjuncts and they're diluting that high fan level down. So the, the, the malt that we use, at least in North America, is too high for craft beer. And so if there's a way to reduce that, that would also help um, reduce oxidation in your beer. Well, I tell you what, I, I promised everybody we would pour uh, the Goose Island IPA. But while I'm pouring it, I know we normally talk about it. I had the opportunity to spend about two and a half hours with Ken Grossman uh, back in the fall. And he was walking me through his approach for all of his beers, but in particular Celebration. And he really emphasized in Celebration Ale, at least, the importance of crystal malt in yeah, that particular beer. Yeah. Uh, but I also went to find out, as I asked the brewers, because I thought surely Sierra Nevada has a beer without crystal malt. Uh, I think there's only one in general, and it's the hazy. So yeah. Ken feels very strongly, at least in his all his years, that and, and we were specifically talking about celebration ale, but it spills over in the others. Uh, clearly, he thinks it's an important thing. So, what, what, how would you contrast that against your belief that maybe not? Yeah, yeah, no, and you know, Ken, Ken is a huge uh, mentor, a big old friend, longtime friend, one of my best friends actually, and mentor. And um, you know, they're just it's just varying philosophies of, of brewing. And I think it really goes to the fact that there is no right or wrong way of making a beer. Um, using crystal malt in, in an IPA or a hoppy beer is definitely an old school um, technique. But I, I think Ken would also tell you that he doesn't want you drinking it at, you know, six months old, um, because it's, it's going to be a shell of a beer of what it was originally. And, um, and and you can't a beer like that that has always been so iconically red in color like there's no way to to really get that and keep the same flavor um i think what's important there is like just drink it fresh um you know i remember uh, before charlie bamforth retired from uc davis and i would go speak at his class at davis every year and we would always go out to dinner and have a, a nice meal and chit chat and you know i asked him uh what's the best thing I can do as a brewer? And this is before we had our new modern dream brewery. What's the best thing we can do to keep our beers fresh? And he said, just keep them cold. Like, and, and that's, that's a little oversimplification because you, know, you wanna make sure you have a little packaging uh, oxygen, which is something that Ken and I have talked about for hours. And we actually went down the rabbit hole of buying uh, a small can line he needed it for his pilot brewery. We needed it just to run normal day-to-day -day cans. But we went down that road together and had the exact same line. And we tested together and shared all the information. But anyways, all things being equal and you have low DO, like the best thing you can do, I remember Charlie telling me, is like, just keep your beer cold. And, you know, and, and that that is oversimplifying it. But going back to your question, um, you know, that's just something that they believe in and, and that that's a part of their, their uh their recipes and, you know, Torpedo has crystal malt, obviously Sierra Nevada Pale Ale does. Um, they're, they're, they're going a lot deeper than any brewery is. I mean, they've, they've got this piece of equipment called the ICP instrument that can basically measure like metal ions and, you know, measure the iron content and finding where exactly the oxidation is coming from and then honing in on it. And they've got, much greater uh, lab instrumentation than the average brewery. And we have a pretty nice lab, but it pales in comparison to what Ken has. And I, and I will also add that we always have Sierra Nevada Pale Ale in our fridge at home. It's still one of my favorite beers. Well, as we wrap up, I thought what I would do is kind of show all these lined up. We look at the color differences. All right, so I will make sure these are clear. So we have Pliny, move this mic, Pliny over here. We have the double dry hopped Pliny. We have the blind pig here. And this is the uh, Goose Island yeah. IPA. Which is just a little slight bit darker. 
you can mm -hmm. I, at least I can see that from the uh, malts, the extra specialty malts that mm -hmm. they use. Um, and and theirs is definitely a little brighter. The goose is. Um, I I uh, randomly I went to my local supermarket, which has a huge beer selection, and they didn't have or they were out of Goose Island, so I was not able to to grab one. But um, I'll I'll trust your taste there on your end, Doug. Okay. I ain't tried it yet. And it's, it's quite a bit lighter than what we've been trying. So it's yeah. a little bit of an unfair comparison, but yeah. very drinkable. It's a bit sweeter. Yeah. Which which could be that C60 in there. Mine, I'm guessing, since it has an expiration date of August 20th. I'm guessing it's roughly three months old, two months old, maybe, uh, depending on kind of, I'm not sure what they allow. Yeah. I would guess it'd be four months, three months tops, three and a half, something like that. I know uh, it is, what, 150 days at Sierra Nevada. And you might not even let yours go that long. No, we go with a bottled on date and then uh, let the consumer decide uh you know if it's where they want it to be as opposed to saying best buy you know like a gallon of milk um there, there's no right or wrong way of, of doing that um it's and we have a salesperson and that works for russian river in virtually every market that sells our beer so we're out there combing the market and um and our consumers our our customers reach out and tell us and, you know, they'll sometimes email us and say, you know what, I, I bought a bottle and it was a, yeah, it was three months old or whatever, it just didn't taste right. And they'll email, tell us, and we're happy to replace the bottle. And, you know, we, we are uh, focused on as the best flavor and aroma quality as possible. And when you're making IPAs that are, you know, big over the top dry hop beers like we do. And, and honestly, not even close to what some of the smaller breweries are doing now, but, you know, we know we have really low oxygen levels, total package of oxygen. And that's something we're fanatical about. I always say it's kind of our religion, but, um, but we're always looking to uh, make sure that our accounts are selling the beer at the freshest. They're keeping it cold. They're selling it cold. And also we're managing their par, you know, how much beer they get each week, whether it's distributed directly from us or from one of our distributors and make sure that they don't have too much of it sitting in back so that the customer is always grabbing it, you know, hopefully when it's two, three weeks old, maybe four weeks tops. But I, I, I say drink it within eight weeks. If keeping it cold, 12 weeks max, don't go, go, don't go past 12, even kept cold. And, and cause you'll lose too much of the nice, fresh hop, you know, note to it. And, you know, if you you wouldn't buy a, a you know jug of milk that was past its date or sitting out warm, so why do your why 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 buy your IPA that way? <laughs> well, I know that's especially true of Celebration Ale, which is a fabulous beer when it's a few weeks old, but it seems to diminish, and it could be that crystal malt. I don't know. All beer is oxidized, uh, you know, that's just, that's just what happens. And Joshua and so, Walton calls it the enjoy by date. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's it. So as we wrap up, we're here talking about double dry hopping and there's hop Creek. There's the Humulones change and the IBUs change. We're talking about crystal malt. We covered a lot of topics. But if you were to bring it all together and, and you were speaking at a conference and you were telling brewers, hey, bottom line, these are the three most important things or two, whatever the number is, about dry hopping beers, what what would that be? Would you? I know I'm catching you cold on that. Yeah, no, uh, yeast health is oddly the first one because it's, it is a, one of the biggest contributors to uh, – hop creep is poor yeast health. And if you have good yeast health, so making good zinc additions for yeast nutrient, that's that's definitely gonna uh, be one. Um, watch your pH. Um, pH is definitely something that, you know, I, I just pulled up the 
Q and A, and I see that you know someone asked about um, pH rise, and and so you got to watch your your pH because that's going to help. Uh, you're going to have hop creep no matter what if you you know when you're dry hopping in significant quantities, but dry hopping does increase pH, and and so you got to control your um, your your pH and and make sure that that's not too high because otherwise you'll never clear the diacetyl on basically what's a secondary diacetyl rest after after hop creep and um you know and then i'll and i'll just say it's a pretty stereotypical answer but i'm going to use it um is the freshness and the quality of your ingredients really matter you know we it's something that Ken always made a cornerstone of Sierra Nevada, and uh, and it's something that I think all great brewers put a focus on. Whether it's malt, hops, you know, yeast, the, you know, the viability, cell counter of yeast, whatever it is, um, those those are those are the three things that I would I would focus on because you can't you can't take poor hops and make a well made dry hop beer. Um, that it's just it's just not going to translate because those those hops if they have an off aroma to them or flavor to them you just you just can't cover it up. Look, this is the uh, blind pig, which we opened almost an hour ago. And look at the head and look at the <laughs> lacing. Uh, that's pretty impressive. That's been sitting out room temperature for an hour. Uh, by the way, it won't go to waste. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so. No, it will not go to waste. But I, that's pretty impressive. Beautiful beer. Well, folks, what a journey we've been on with Vinny Serluzzo. We've delved deep into the brewing world and emerged with a treasure trove of insights. I hope you're feeling as enriched and inspired as I am. Remember the joys in the journey. And in our case, that journey is about great beer. So until next time. Here's to all the knowledge yet to be tapped and all the beers yet to be savored. Cheers! <laughs>